Cool. Uh, hey, Robbie from All Them Witches. How's it going? Fantastic. How are you? Yeah, you look like you're in a pretty nice studio right yeah, now. Uh, yeah. Tell me about your location. Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles and uh, I've been setting up this studio for a little while. And uh, my buddy drove out to New Mexico uh, last week. So he had a, a van full of gear and he got dropped off in the middle of the desert. So I went and picked him up and we kind of finished routing and setting up things here so we can stay busy. Yeah. How's it been for you? Because, I mean, such a weird year for everybody and you guys, you guys tour so much. Um, so it must have been kind of a weird adjustment. How, how, how did everything go down with the whole pandemic thing? Uh, it, was, it was pretty hectic. Um, so we went, we flew to London, I think March 9th, we were there, or that was our first day in the studio, something like that. And we get there and then we're like, oh, this, this thing called coronavirus is happening. And like, some people are freaking out. I was like, should we be freaking out? I don't know, let's just record this record. And, you know, I just kept my eyes on the news just to see what was going on. And it just like kept getting worse and worse. And I was like, I was showing these guys like, dude, this is like crazy shit's happening right now. I don't like, and like people are closing all of their shit and like shutting cities down and stuff. I was like, this is insane. And uh, British Airways started canceling flights um, right before we were supposed to come home. So we were all a little concerned about that. Um, but we ended up, uh, I think we flew back on, I've got my dates wrong here. We flew back, I think on March 10th. We got there the first couple of days in March. Um, and uh, yeah, it was an empty flight. And then I landed in Nashville late. And then a few hours later, I grabbed my shit and flew to LA. And then we were supposed to be in Mexico um, on the 13th. And that got canceled. And uh, systematically everything after that got canceled so like we got home right before like just a few days before everything shut down so it was pretty crazy and immediately we were like okay well this tour is done and then I had a feeling that everything was just gonna get shut down and it did so it's, it's weird to have a new album and not be able to go out and support it um I think it's my fault that the world shut down because we were talking about how burnout we were at the end of last year from touring. We were like, fuck man, I need a break. Like I just want a vacation and you know, I wanted some time to work on some of my own things. And then you gotta be careful what you ask for. Cause now we're all wishing we were on tour. I am. Um, I was in Mexico. So you guys were in London then experiencing probably people like stockpiling loo roll and just going completely bananas. Yeah. We couldn't find any hand sanitizer or, or anything like that. And then when I got back home, we were, uh, you know, the shit started going off and we would go to the grocery store and no one was wearing masks yet. Um, but it was just like a frenzy, like the grocery store shelves were empty. We couldn't believe it. Like everything was gone, all the toilet paper, all the rubbing alcohol, anything to clean with, like it was yeah. all gone. It was, it was crazy. It was like that for weeks. Yeah. Um, like, you know, kind of freaked out. You know, we went to the grocery store, like, four or five times in a week, just all over town, trying to find anything we could. Cause you know, there's seven people in this house and uh, it's a lot of food and, and shit. So but it is like mellowed out. Like, you know, the pandemic is still raging here, but you know, some things are opened up. Like me and my girlfriend went out to eat last night, which was the first time we've done that since March. So that was, that was weird to like be able to sit in a restaurant and not wear a mask and it was, it was kind of a trippy experience. I never thought going out to a restaurant would, would feel like I was on shrooms or something. But yeah, it feels so wild, like just doing something like that. But what's, because in the UK, we're now having like a restriction. So pubs have to shut at 10 o'clock at night and things are starting to kind of ramp up again a little bit here with the second wave. What's it like in LA? Like, is, is that, is it still just? Still, it's still going. Um, yeah. Basically everything is, more or less shut down. I mean, things are open to just like a few people at a time, but you know, you drive around and there's nobody, there's nobody out anywhere doing anything, which is kind of crazy, except for the house across the street from mine, like some famous TikTok, TikTok YouTube <laughs> assholes moved in across the street. And dude, there were, they had these two parties. There were like 300 kids in the street and the house across the street from ours is pretty small. Um, 
they actually got in a lot of shit. The city's pressing charges against them. I was out here. They they were fighting. They pulled out a gun. or like holding a gun to people's heads. So like, oh. there have been these parties that have been raging. Um, and the city's doing all this stuff to shut them down. Uh, but like the stores and the and the bars and stuff, like you can't really go do any of that stuff. And and we don't really want to. We live with uh, an older lady who's immunosuppressed, so we have to be super careful with her. Like even just like if she gets a cold, it's she's got to go to the ER. We had a scare the other day where she had to go to the emergency room because she got food poisoning and she was in the hospital for days. So we've got to be super careful. So we've got a good thing going on at the house and we've just kind of uh, been enjoying what we can and making the best of it. Yeah. That's all we can do really. So you yeah. were in, so you were in London and you were obviously uh, making an album at Abbey Road Studio too. Like there is, there's a lot of history in those walls. <laughs> How yeah. was it? How was it making the record in like one of the most amazing studios for like capturing a live sound, you know? It was pretty cool. Um, I would say that it was, you know, I think we've only one other time, like when we did Sleeping Through the War, we actually went into a studio that we didn't set up ourselves. Um, besides the first record, we did it at a friend's studio, but like to go out to like a company that owns a studio, um, We'd only done that once before, but this was totally different. Um, it was pretty wild, you know, we got there and it was kind of an out of body experience walking around and like seeing, they've got pictures everywhere, all over the walls. So we're like, oh, there's Mick Jagger standing where you're doing your vocals. Um, and then like to be able to check out the gear they had and like just wheeling in carts, piles of crazy microphones that you should never be allowed to touch that people back in the day had to wear white gloves and lab coats and no one could touch anything. And here we are in whatever century we were in, same century, I guess, that was back then. Um, but yeah, I mean, we could touch everything and it was fun. It was really cool. Um, the vibes were thick. I almost shed a few tears when we first got there and it was like, we were settling in. We're like, man, this is this is pretty wild. But it was real smooth. We brought our our friend Mikey out, who did Dying Surfer with us, and he helped us uh, put it together. And we trusted him with the sound, and to he knew what we wanted to do. So it was it was very cool, and um, I'm really thankful for that opportunity that we got to go there. Yeah, I remember you saying um, we. I interviewed you guys backstage at Scala, which was your second London tour, I believe. I remember that show specifically because some crazy person ran, like when we were off stage, the, well, you know where the side door is or whatever to get into the green room. Yeah. I just, like when the door opened, some, I just turned around and there was a dude like this close to my face freaking out and security came and grabbed him and like bear hugged him and we like wrestled him out. So yeah, I remember that show. I remember you being there too. Was he, was he all right? Was he, was he just a bit like? He was all right. He was, he was, he was out <laughs> back by the bus waiting to talk to us when the show was over. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. I remember chatting to you guys before that, I think. Um, that was before you guys went on stage. Um, and you had said, you'd, you'd said that you'd made um, Sleeping Through the War. Basically, you had like the album ready that you were like super prepared and that you um, went in, wrote it in four days and then recorded it in six. So I remember being like, oh my God, that is that is a crazy kind of short oh. amount of time to get an, a record together and done. What was it like this time for Nothing Is The Ideal? Like, did you guys have it all kind of mapped out or was it more of like an improvisation thing once you were at Abbey Road? Well, uh, we had it mapped out. So I've got a studio in Tennessee in a church and that was the plan. Like we had last year, we had like four months off or something. And we we're like, all right, we're going to use that four months to record and like demo things. And like, we're just going to record it at the church, you know, um, sounds awesome in there about a bunch of cool gear. And then it came down to it and like nothing was happening. So I just ended up doing a bunch of demos and a couple of things ended up on the record from me doing that stuff. But we were over there rehearsing something. We were just fucking around. And then Ben was like, you know, Abbey Road is, he was like, somebody told me that Abbey Road's available. And like, we got the price on it. We we're like, this is affordable. We can do it. Like, well, how do you, how do you say no to that? So we said yes to it. And 
I don't remember how much time we had leading up to it, um, but we definitely worked out the majority of the stuff there and uh, just banged it out when we got to the studio. I think I got the drums done in the first two days. Um, and then I just got to sit around and try to tell people what to do and give my, my humble opinion about things for the rest of the week. <laughs> <laughs> did you, did you kind of like, did it all just come together quite easily and quickly then? Did you, or did you go back and nitpick at stuff? Like we, you... um, we, there was definitely nitpicking, but it was all done like within a week's time, except for see you next fall. That was the last thing we did in the studio. I think we had like two or three hours left before we had to pack up. So we were just like, well, we saved the end time for a jam. Like we knew we wanted to put a jam on there. Um, and I think parks ended up, it was, it was like a 45 minute jam or something. And then Ben kind of picked out the, the parts that were, that were record worthy. And then parks did the, um, did the words at home, I think for that one. Right. But yeah, there was a, li a little nitpicking, um, but we like to leave that stuff to the to the actual recording session because the last minute decisions are kind of the fun things that give it the color and the new dimension that you're that you're surprised by, and we need we need an element of surprise to, to keep it fun. I think. Yeah. And how many days were you in Abbey Road then? How many days on the clock? Um, I think we were there for seven days or maybe eight days, something like that. Yeah. I think so, the whole trip was maybe nine or 10 days. And first day we didn't do anything. And then, yeah, I'm not good at math. <laughs> so pretty speedy then really like that's, yeah. yeah. It was definitely, yeah. definitely speedy. We could yeah. afford it because we weren't there very long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I remember as well, you talking about sleeping through the war and kind of describing it as a can of worms and, um, it's like you, I think you said you basically were driving with the record and you were just like listening to it and you just, all the songs kind of like got in your head. And I, I was doing a lot of driving um, the last two weekends and just had this record on. And I kind of feel like this maybe goes like one up on the can of worms kind of state yeah. stakes, this record. <laughs> like good. there's some absolutely amazing tunes on it. Um, and I want to play, like, I want to play a few, and I think we should play some as well from the, from your back catalogue, but, um, I think, like, let's just go in, Rats in Ruin, tell me about this, it's like a fucking Pink Floyd opus or something. I love the song, uh, so we were at, we were at the church, and Parks just started strumming this bass line and singing the words, and I was like, dude, what is that? I was like, because sometimes he'll do this, and... I'll be like, wow, that's amazing, dude. We have to record that. He's like, oh, that's somebody else's song. Yeah. So when he did this, I was like, Parks, please tell me that you made that. He's like, yeah, I'm working on this right now. I was like, okay, that's great. So we, Ben was there and we just set up a couple mics and recorded him singing and uh, doing bass at the same time. And then Ben left and uh, me and Parks were sitting around and I was like, dude, let's go in. Like, let's do this song right now. Let's just do a demo which I want to release it because this demo is really cool. Um, maybe it'll make a, an appearance sometime, but yeah, we just fired up some tape machines and went crazy with it. And uh, the vibe was really thick and intense. So when we got there, we knew like that was a really special song and uh, we really spent time figuring out the right sounds for that and the right equipment to, to reproduce what we did at home. Cause that vibe was so strong. I was like, dude, we can't, like it's got to top that vibe or at least match it, which is hard because I get like demo-itis a lot. Um, and I definitely still have it. Like when I listen to the first version of that, I'm like, man, this is so sick. <laughs> like it's totally different, but it's still like just as cool or maybe cooler in my opinion. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, that's a long song. Um, I just uh, finished a music video for it and that should be coming out sometime soon. A 10 minute music video. I wanted to do like, the first three minutes before we got to the weird, weird sounds, but my girlfriend helped uh, write it and direct it with me and stars in it. So she was like, no, it's gotta be the whole 10 minutes or like, we can't do it. And I was like, fuck a 10 minute music video. This and like three minutes, like two minutes of just weird sounds. Yeah. But uh, we really, we really did it. I think it's, I think it's awesome. So we're just waiting to see if anyone's going to premiere it right now. So that's the entire story of rats and room. <laughs> well, the last, like the last two and a half minutes, just like pure emotion 
you know, in the playing, like it, yeah, it's just, I, it sort I felt a little bit like I did when I first heard Bulls from, I can't remember which record Bulls is on. Sleeping. Sleeping, yeah. But like, but it's even, it goes even beyond that. It's just like, oh, so, yeah. it's so powerful the way, because it's like sort of two songs, like it's the, the, the first half and then it builds and builds and then that ending is just like, <laughs> yeah, it's heavy duty. That's uh, I told good way Parker, to like, finish the record, you know, like good way to finish it. Leave people yeah, like, on that. Definitely couldn't have been the first song. I told Parks like, man, this is the saddest fucking song I've ever heard in my life. He yeah. was like, no, man, this is a happy song. I was like, I don't know where you're from, dude, but this is <laughs> this is not happy. But there are some uh, there are some happy vibes at the end of it for sure. See You Next Fall is, is another one that I think is a kind of moment on the record. Um, and I, I mean, just the title, See You Next Fall, I know, I know like lyrics is more Parks' territory, but um, was there stuff on this record that you wrote pre-coronavirus and pre the pandemic that like was weirdly apt or kind of, yeah, poignant after? Oh man, I, I want to say that I, that he didn't really know he might have had some of that stuff written down. I'm not sure, um, but it definitely kind of turned into a prophecy, so to speak. Um, you know, at least even if he wrote the words, like while we were in the studio, we had no idea that the entire year was going to get canceled. Like that was way beyond like what we actually thought would go down. Um, and then it ended up totally being prophetic. See you next fall. Um, and we just announced a Europe tour next fall. So if everything's cool, we'll see you next fall. <laughs> yeah, let's hope so. Let's hope in a year we can get back to live gigs. I feel like, I mean, everyone is just so starved of it right now. Yeah, let's hope uh, in a year that I can, that I still have my place. <laughs> I can <laughs> keep paying my rent. Yeah, like how's it been for you guys, you know, when you do spend so much time together on the road and now you're all, you're all in different parts of America at the moment, aren't you and stuff? Yeah, we're all, Ben's in Florida Parks is in the middle of the country, just like out in the woods. He's got a cabin out there. He just moved. We were neighbors. Uh, he lived next to me in the church, um, but he's since moved. I still have that place. Um, it's a little weird, but it's, it's okay. Like, we're all, we're all fine with it. We, we still talk, and, but we're all working on our own things right now. Um, we're trying to figure out something to do. Uh, with ATW in the fall like we're talking about getting together out here and, and working on some stuff I don't know if that's going to happen um, but we'll see like I know Parks is working on some music for himself Ben just put out his own album I just put out an album um, right before the ATW album came out now I'm working on a second one so we're all just staying busy and um, hopefully it'll be some I know everybody we know like all these other bands like everyone's making an album right now uh but it's, we just finished ours so it's kind of cool that we have a have a little bit of a break we've got a little bit of a time to figure out what, we, what we're doing and, and not to really worry about it because we can't we can't sit around and stress about it we've we already did that we already did all the work and it was kind of cool to be able to finish the record right before that shit went down because we actually could take a breath and you know the world is a stressful place right now like there's so much bad shit happening and it's good to just be at home with the people you love and be able to be there physically for someone and yeah so there's some blessings happening in the middle of all this fucking bullshit yeah and and like you say like a kind of like you guys you know you've been pretty prolific like every every album you tour it then you're kind of straight back into the next so it's probably quite a nice little breather to, to actually yeah to do those solo projects or side projects and kind of have a bit of headspace i yep. mean you, you've just released a record though so like you know it's not like you're at a point where you've been away for like seven years and everyone's like where's the next record <laughs> yeah exactly and that was our that was our last record for our record label so we've got you know, honestly, like the kind of the speed at which we put out records, it's, it's got a lot to do with us being like, oh, it's time to do something else. You know, like we're in this thing where it's like we have to tour to make money because we got to pay our rent. We need to do stuff. We got to, you know, if we put out a record, we get a little bit of money from the label. 
but now it's like there's no label the tour is like where's the tour so we've got time to figure out what we're going to do with the next with the next one if someone's going to give us an offer from a record label or if we're going to do it independently or or what so yeah would you ever go with like a would you consider going with like a big major label kind of vibe or or not really man it it really depends i've heard some horror stories and a lot of people i know are like dude you don't want to do that and it's not like the old days like people weren't really giving out big advances you know like if there was a if there was a giant advance where it's like oh shit you know like i could pay some stuff off i can i could live for a while off of this money and then, yeah maybe we would we would entertain it but i mean it would have to be something ridiculous um to do that because it would because there's a there's a big trade-off i think with the major label even though we've never had an experience with the major label we know a lot of people who have and have been involved in that stuff and a lot of them have just been disappointed so we're not sure yeah and for you guys as well, you have so much ownership over it from the, the look of like, you know, the videos, the artwork, the music, everything is, re and you have from the beginning. So, you know. Yeah, that's, the, that's something cool that uh, we we kind of insisted on. It's like, no one's tried to A&R us. I mean, they have a few times where we're like, nah, they're like, oh, maybe this person should produce your record or let's get this person to mix this. And we're always just like, nah, yeah. we'll figure it out. Um, so that's the cool thing. Like we definitely don't need someone telling us what some shit should look like or sound like. And um, I think once you get into that major label place, especially if you're not, you know, selling records is hard. And if you're not selling a shitload of records, people aren't like, in a, and you're on a major label, I don't think they're going to give you the artistic freedom to do whatever you want. Cause they think they know, but then again, I'm speaking from non-experience. So. Yeah. Um, next track. I mean, the album's got, it's got like the heavy kind of chuggers, but it's also got, um, the children of the Coyote woman, which is kind of a bit more acoustic and slightly like softer moment on the record, even though like you get a bit fighty in the video, which I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> a bit fighty with, um, Evan Smith, don't you? Um, yeah. to kind of reflect the story of the, of the track. But yeah, can you tell me a bit about how that one came together? That song? Yeah. Um, it was another thing that me and Parks were just sitting around at the church late night and he just started playing this thing. He's like, oh, I'm working on this. And I was like, oh, well, let's demo that. We did like several tape demos. And that's another one that I really want to release because I really like the way it sounds. And it's totally different than the record. Um, but yeah, it was just like an, his continuation of a story. And I don't know really what, how all of those stories tie together because I didn't make them, but, uh, yeah, that was, uh, I think recording that in Abbey Road, that might have been the most difficult one to do because the vibe's so slow and like the way that I play drums and it's hard to find a balance with a song like that and, and what to play um, dynamically. Uh, so we, I think that might've taken us the longest to do, um, to get it right. We tried a bunch of different stuff, different ways of, recording the drums and like what to do first and you know we were kind of chasing around tail with that song for for a little bit but we figured it out yeah that I, one was kind of stressful yeah going to lightning at the door that that um was the first music that i heard by you guys back in i feel so old like seven years ago in 2013 um, when I heard it in a coffee shop and was just like, went over to the guy who was making the coffee and was like, I need to know who this band is. And he was like, oh, they're an amazing band from Nashville. No one knows about them, but they're amazing. And then that was, um, it was Mountain was playing. So oh, I feel yeah. like we should play Mountain. Um, Do it. Yeah. What, what, like, what does that track mean to you now? Because that was, yeah, off your earlier record. I don't even remember how to play it, I don't think. I'd have to listen to it. Um... I don't know. That was just something Parks Parks did. I remember I just, oh uh, God, we were living in this really tiny house, uh, three bedroom with five dudes. We built a bed that was hanging from the ceiling for somebody to sleep off of. They had to get up there by climbing a rope. <laughs> uh, we had three dogs in there. The front yard turned into a mud pit because we put an 18 foot teepee tent out there for the train kids to sleep in. Um, 
yeah, that's what was going on around that time. But I can't really remember much of writing that song. I just remember it like kind of had this weird part um, for the drums, like a weird time thing. I remember we rehearsed, I mean, we rehearsed that record constantly because we had a house and we all lived, me and Parks lived together, Ben just lived down the road. So that point in all them, which is we were rehearsing all the time. Like once me and Ben and Parks all got together, I think for the first two albums, um, we were always playing. We had a, we were doing it at my house and then I was renting a rehearsal space for everybody and we just played all the time. And that's how that, that stuff came out. Um, but then after that, our, our uh, rehearsal days kind of fucking dwindled. <laughs> <laughs> what track would you play off uh, Lightning at the Door, if asked? Uh, <laughs> it's maybe Swallowed by the Sea or Family Song for the Leaving, I think is on there. Yeah. Maybe one of those. Let's play a track uh, off. Dying Surfer Meets His Maker. I was I immediately went to open passageways, but I I I don't mind which one. What what would you play off that record? What's your favorite track? You know, when we made that record, I remember it because we basically made that whole thing up on the spot, except for um what were what was it? Open Passageways, Call Me Star, and then there's one other one that Parks wrote. I can't remember what it was called. He demoed those by himself. And uh, we didn't even really play them together. But when we went in there, we basically made it all up on the spot. And I remember listening to it being like, does this suck? Is anyone going to like this shit? And now it's one of my favorites. But I think my favorite song off of that would be uh, This Is Where It Falls Apart. Mm. That or Welcome to the Caveman Future. We've never played either one of those songs. Um, but I guess I would play This Is Where It Falls Apart. Okay, cool. And then we also need to talk about Bulls which is um, such a good track. <laughs> that one kicks off the Sleeping Through the Wall, Sleeping Through the War even. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the first song on there? Huh? Is it the first one? I don't remember. I think it is, yeah. Because it sort of starts the record and then like, again, it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like Rats and Ruin. It's just got an epic build on it. It's like, kind of blows your ears off. That's a crazy song. I remember whenever we would play that, I would almost pass out at the end. Like I couldn't really do it until the end of a tour after we played it the whole time. That, yeah. that song always stressed me out. I was like, fuck, dude, my arms are going to fall off at the end of this. Um, do, you, do you guys sort of like, because now you're three piece, aren't you? Um, and it's just you three. But like, there is like, when you first met the guys, was that, did you, was there just this kind of like instant, like chemistry between you guys playing because I and did you realize like just how sick Ben is at the guitar <laughs> like he shreds <laughs> yeah so that that whole thing happened I I just moved to Nashville from Oregon and I was living in my car and then I just I found a place I didn't know anybody like I had no friends and I was, there was a bar down the street I was like oh I'm just gonna go to this bar on board and he was playing with like some singer songwriter guy and he was playing slide like some real basic stuff, but I was like, I was like, I think this guy's really good at guitar. Um, so after where I just started talking to him and I was like, talking about all this weird jazz music. I was like, are you into this shit? He was like, yeah. I was like, you want to come over and jam? I was like, I just live down the street. He was like, yeah, he came over. He was on time. And I think we jammed like once. And then the next time he came over, he brought it a little four track recorder and we just started demoing stuff and like me and Ben demoed like half the first record together um just me playing drums and then we were like well we need this is this is cool like I think we can make a band out of this but we need a bass player we tried out two or three guys and and Parks was just the one that that made sense he just felt like he was like oh there's a lot of room to grow but he's like really he's got the feel and this is cool and I didn't know that he, he could really sing. So that just turned out to be a bonus. And he was quiet for months. Um, and then Alan, I knew Alan, uh, I've known him since I was 18. I met him in Ohio when we were both uh, in school together. Um, and he had already had like some Nashville experience or friends down there or whatever. So I was like, oh, you should move down here and, and be in this band. So then, so, so he did. But yeah, there was, it was all pretty instant. Yeah. You know, 
oh this is cool like this is working yeah and then now like all these years later like it still it still feels like it's there like when you tour so much do you do you find that you kind of like things are still good and it's like you know or do, like do you get tour fatigue much or like moments where it's like tough oh, for sure yeah I mean it's it's like you're waiting around all day to you've got like three two or three hours three hours during the day where you have to be responsible and like do something so it's just like a lot of sitting around and just like battling yourself to be healthy versus like should I just sit around and smoke cigarettes all day like oh here's a case of beer should we drink this probably not let's should I do some push-ups probably should I do some yoga should I go on a walk and not talk to anyone for hours yes <laughs> um so yeah I mean it's it's fun but it's it's hard and you know at first when we were touring you know sleeping in a van all the time which sometimes we still do but you know crashing on strangers floors and like that shit was exciting for a little bit because it was all new and we had no um, real responsibility. It was just basically just like a party. And now it's like, oh, we got to be responsible. Like everyone's getting paid. Like we need to keep the ship tight and like keep this fucking place clean. Like pick up your trash and like don't be an asshole. And, but we all get get along pretty well. But everybody's got their moments where it's just like go take a walk you know like we all we're we're good at keeping each other like giving each other our space and stuff but it, it'll, it'll grind you down like being on the road for you know four to six weeks at a time and then taking a little break like and then going out again like it wears you down you know it's, it's hard to be away from your house and and all the people you care about for all that time you know and it's progressively just gotten a little bit harder for everybody because you know it's it's stressful you know different time zones and like not being able to talk to people you want to talk to and uh but it is it is worth it and when you're in those moments at the beginning of tour you're like oh this is eternal like this is never going to end like i gotta sit i gotta be in the in the in the bus for 30 hours before we get to the next place like that happens yeah. and you just gotta like really keep your shit together which is is challenging but but we do it yeah and like you say the payoff must be you know the payoff of those three hours in the moment when you've got the crowd there that are like loving your music and have been listening to the records and connecting with it that must be it's, it's a it's a big deal and it's, it's a crazy feeling and um it's really something to be able to to change people's emotional state and like give people hope or like fill people up with joy and then at the same time, like, that's your life force that you're feeding into yourself. And it's like this big group thing that spreads through the world. And like, it's really a beautiful thing to be able to do that and have people resonate with, with what you're doing. It's really wild. Man. And it's, it's a trip for sure. Yeah. And have you felt like over the last sort of three or four years, particularly like, the momentum build with that just like more people know about your music more people know about your band and are like you know getting into it yeah it's been it's been uh it's been a slow burn but it's been a good burn um and every most tours like everything is an, an upgrade and it has been um you know when we first got into this you know i had all these visions of how things would go and i thought that this would have all happened years ago but you know we're learning a lot about all that stuff and then you like kind of see the reality of how hard it is to be in a rock band and like to to be able to go around the world and i remember the first europe tour we did we drove ourselves and we were playing like 250 to 300 cap rooms or something and almost everything was sold out but then like our first show was in israel and in greece those were our first two shows and it was like 700 and then 1200 people like sold out and like these are the biggest shows we've ever played um and it's in these crazy places in the world and then it's just like you know it gave us a lot of confidence and it just kept going and it's still going like sometimes it feels like people don't know who the band is or anything like that because rock and roll like in a sense 
is kind of dead, or at least like the rock and roll glamorous vision, you know, like when I go home for the holidays or whatever, my family's like, oh man, you know, you're, you're living this crazy lifestyle and like it must be so glamorous it's like not really you know it's like we're not partying you know no one really does that we just go it's like a job you know we do our job it's like a cool job and it's fun but it's it's exhausting and blah 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 I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore Yeah, but there's like a lot of... It sounds like I'm just complaining about everything. No, no, not at all, not at all, not at all. Yeah, but I remember that first, that first time you came and played in London at the Lexington, um, the first tour, because you'd been playing loads in America and you'd really built up like a, like a following, but it took quite a bit of time for you to finally get to London. And I walked into that show and it was just full, the Lexington was full. And I was like... Yeah, I remember that. We did two, two nights there. Yeah, it was sick. It was amazing. I remember I couldn't tell. I thought like we did a really bad job. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like it seems like things are, are going pretty well. So next, like next moves, I guess. Hopefully, we can do like you know you'll be able to do this tour next year. A bit more time, a few more months, really, before we're like you know even able to get back to small gigs. I think. But um, what it, what else is next? What's your What's your other project called? Just people want to check it's, it out. Uh, it's just my Instagram handle. It's called UV Ways. Yeah, and that's that's a project. So a lot. If he's still in the frame, he's the bass player, and uh, Evan Smith is the singer and the guitar player. And the album is called Moses Lynx, L Y N X, and uh, it's named after a cat that showed up the last day we recorded and got hit by a car and we took him to the vet and saved him and he lived um what a beautiful story (laughs) yeah that that album is like basically it's just demos that i was making for atw like when we had all that time off um to write a record and it just really didn't happen so a lot came over and we set up a studio and we were just basically experimenting with a lot of different weird shit and different tape players and weird routing and stuff and you know when quarantine hit i was like oh, i need to do something with like i was listening back to this stuff i was like this is all really bizarre but it's really cool like i gotta do something with it so i just hit up evan and i was like yo dude i've got all this weird music i want to send it to you and see if you want to do something with it and he just sent like awesome shit back and i was like all right well that's it so that's what it is. UV Ways, Moses Links. That's the album. Uh, my side project. Out? When's it coming out? It's out. Oh, it's out now. Oh, cool. Yeah, we're, just, we're working on new stuff now. Um, but yeah, Ben put out his stuff. He's been putting out stuff under the name Wood Splitter. He put out something uh, recently. Um, and I think Parks is in the woods right now working on his own shit that we've been trying to like get him to do his own album. And I think he's he's doing it right now. So. Hopefully soon we'll have uh, his side of the story. Yeah. And then maybe like further down the line, tour this record and like, there's going to be more, right? You're not, you're not, uh, you're not going to go on a long hiatus, are you? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, we, I was talking to Ben the other day about the, the next ATW album. I was like, dude, cause we went into this one and the last record was, it's not my favorite record. It was kind of a weird time. There's some cool stuff on there, um, but that really was a big experiment. I, I felt like the whole thing was kind of an experiment. Um, so we came up to this one and we were like, dude, let's make something heavy. Cause Ben, like Wood Splitter, Ben's solo stuff is like all like intense, heavy shit. And we were like, let's, let's bring some of this style into this record and kind of regroup and, and get people's attention again. Um, so that's what we did so yeah the other day me and ben were talking on the phone about what we want the next album to be like and it's gonna be totally different and uh yeah so we're we're still planning on doing stuff for sure good do you feel uh like most proud of this one is it is it your kind of do you feel like i think there's people saying it's like your best ever what what do you Um, i don't (laughs) it's hard to say it's your best ever because i i think that every album has one of our best or some of our best songs on it and this is just a different thing it's just like another letter in the alphabet that is our alphabet um 
production wise, like sound wise, I think it's, it's the best, like it's the most professional and um, the biggest sounding, but there's other stuff like for me, it's just the vibe, you know, like Dying Surfer and there's stuff on sleeping that is just, to me, is just next level. Awesome. Like I would love to put out a best of ATW album and I get to pick all the songs and nobody else does. <laughs> you do the best of, and then you should also do the alternative demos one. The worst of? <laughs> the best and the worst. <laughs> Watch the worst sell better than the best. <laughs> um, it's so nice to chat to you. Thank you so much, Robbie. Yeah, thanks a lot. It was cool.